was this the second top vote getter was um, tell me about the art and the architecture and how that's coming about and that will so that session is happening next Wednesday the 9th and I hope you will join we are actually making a video of the of our artists and the work in progress that they're doing and it is it is amazing and I really hope you will join to see it it's very special um, but we'll cover that next week but tonight we wanted to talk about what are the programs? What are the resources? What are the things that we're going to be able to do in this library that we can't do today? So we like to start these um, discussions with a huge thanks to our partners, the taxpayers of Washington State uh, who uh, contributed to our capital grant, a capital grant uh, that made this project possible, the town of Winthrop and North Central Washington Libraries, uh, our, our partners in this effort, and we wouldn't be here without them. So well, I will give a very quick update on the construction status and the funding status, and then I'm going to turn it over to Todd Treat, who is here from Wenatchee Valley College. Uh, he'll cover uh, a really exciting partnership that we've announced to uh, the town, and uh, he'll fill you in more on what, what that program will look like. And then again, we'll have another session next week about art and architecture. And I will say in advance, I'm going to have to drop off a little early and Shannon will pick it up when I when I leave. OK, Shannon. So by way of schedule, we uh, as you know, we launched the campaign in September of 2019 and broke ground in June of 2020. Uh, right, you know, right before, right after COVID hit, we our brown graping, brown brown groundbreaking ceremony. We all wore masks, and we were in the midst of this thing uh, while we were conducting the capital campaign. As you recall, we had a timeline in order to raise matching funds for that two million dollar state grant and use that. We had to raise the funds and spend the funds before the grant expired in June of 2021. And thanks to the incredible generosity of you all and many others, uh, we were able to raise that money and, and spend that money uh, before the end of that grant period. So we're very um, thankful for that. And we kept going. We kept raising money. We started construction. And we are nearing the point where we will be completing construction. Uh, construction is expected to be completed in April. We hope to get an occupancy permit shortly after that. And at that point, North Central Washington Libraries moves in with shelving, with furniture, with books and resources and technology. And we are targeting a grand opening of June 11th. Um, that date is looking pretty good. It's really dependent on, on just as the whole world is dependent on the supply chain. Um, we are waiting. We are waiting uh -oh. on delivery. And um, <laughs> that slips in any way, we may have to push out the opening. But I just heard today that it's still looking good for furniture delivery towards the end of May. So we're doing we're doing well. So construction activities, if you've driven by the library and you can peek in the window, you've seen a gigantic uh, tree sculpture by artist Tori Carpinko. Um, Tori has named this tree Solace, and uh, we affectionately refer to it and have been referring to it as the learning tree. Uh, it's a 17 foot tall tree harvested north of Winthrop. And you'll learn a lot more about that uh, next week when we hear from Tori directly about this tree. But that was quite a huge effort uh, to uh, get inside the building. And there's a great story on about how that happened. Um, slats and slats and slats. You, when you walk into the library, and I think we had a picture of it, maybe right, but maybe go back up, Shannon, you can see the picture of the slats. Uh, up, 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 go up, backwards. Yeah, these slats are on every ceiling and um, surface on the on uh, you know above the library, and each one of those slats is hand cut and installed by hand on top of a very thick acoustical batting. So that has been hundreds and hundreds of hours and many thousand nails at work by one guy. We need to get his picture. Uh, who has put up every single slat in this building. So lots of development of the roof or the ceiling. Uh, we are working, currently we're working on the interior casework. So that's custom work, built in um, window seats, 
uh, the children's nest, and that's what this picture is showing. We have a children's area that has these fun paneling panel around it that's um, cutouts of shapes of metal animals, flora and fauna uh, that will surround the children's area. Uh, we're building in, uh, again, custom desks, um, custom um, and other custom shelving. And up, right after that, we start putting in the finish work. So our plumbing fixtures goes in, our um, metal fixtures goes in. Uh, we'll be applying, you'll see some work on the outside of the building. Um, again, where the sunscreens and awnings will be added to the, ex, to the uh, what would that be the east and west sides of the building. And more art. Uh, the artists are fast and furious uh, working to develop what's called integrated art, which means it's integrated into the construction. So all of that is happening right now. It's a very busy place. We also are planning our outdoor library. Uh, we have a hardscaping plan. If you can see this picture, it's a little bit out of date, but I think it gives you an idea of the exterior of the building. We really wanna extend the library. To, our, our mission is to gather, connect and discover. And we, we wanna do that in the outdoors. So we're building in um, structures and gardens to where people can gather with bench seating under shaded uh, trees and shaded awnings. There'll be a firewise demonstration garden uh, below the building on the south side of the building where we can all learn about how to, how to firewise our own homes, uh, protect them um, from our annual risk of wildfire. So we have submitted this plan. And if, you, if you're not from Winthrop or you don't know, everything on the outside of the building has to be approved by the, West, the town's westernization committee. And we have done that for the outdoor library and received approval. So we're continuing forward with the hardscaping plan. That includes the, the parking lot, the patios, the plazas, the stairs that lead down in the northeast corner, all the, all the uh, concrete and asphalt and paving work. We're continuing with that. We still need to raise 130,000 for the fire demonstration garden, we call it Living with Fire. It's an educational space and also a great place. Um, there'll be signage and places to sit and just really enjoy the outdoors. So we're actively fundraising for that. And then the, the, the other big part of the project is the solar. As, as we promised the town that we would install solar and we will, um, we decided our, we have a subcommittee of experts, power supply experts that are working on this and decided that the best time to, to raise funds for this would be after we turn the building over to the town. So uh, we will work in partnership with the town to pursue funding for the solar. Uh, we have the solar power system. We have conf configured the, uh, I'm not, not gonna say this in the appropriate engineering terms, but we are wired for solar. So everything that is needed to install the solar panels exists already. So we've made the investment in the wiring and the panels uh, for this equipment. The next step will be raising the money for the panels, sizing the system, and installing the panels, which we will work towards next year. So never fear, we are moving forward. From a funding update, and this is the last thing I'll say, uh, thanks to you all, we met our strategic goal of reaching a thousand individual donors. And by individual, I mean, a couple would be an individual donor. So we have many, many people, we have over a thousand of those donors who've contributed over $4 million. So the state campaign, was just under 2 million, the state capital grant was just under 2 million. We have raised double that in private donations, thanks to you all. Uh, it's been an incredible effort. Um, every donor that wishes, that does not wish to be um, anonymous, who met, uh, who got us, got, a, got their donation to us before our deadline for the door, the donor wall fabrication, will have their names uh, displayed on our uh, donor wall, which will be beautiful. We also have great support from the business sector, contributing $150,000 from anywhere ranging from gifts of $100,000 to $40,000. So we're very thankful for our business sponsors. We talk about them all the time. And as I mentioned, we're still fundraising. Uh, we're still we're, we're needing $130,000 to finish our outdoor library work. So I will stop there and ask if anyone uh, has any questions about the status of the project. I'm happy to answer those. Be sure to take yourself off mute because I can't see if you're talking. <laughs> I was very fast.
All right, we'll keep going then. So really what we want to talk about today is, well, we wanted to answer the question, well, what can we do in our new library? And um, Shanna, if you'll go back up real quick. Sorry, I want to introduce that. We want to talk about what our community, we, we kind of see three primary users of the library, our community um, now and our community in the future. I mean, we, we probably haven't even begun to think about all the ways that we can use this library. We know some needs now, um, but we expect to hear from you on what we can do in the future. North Central Washington Libraries, our lovely librarian, Ree, and her staff uh, will have programming to offer. And we're very excited to, to announce uh, this partnership with Anachi Valley College, and Todd is here tonight to talk about that. So let's move into, I'll tell you real quickly, and then turn it over to Todd. Okay, Shannon. We know that our community, from our needs assessment and from what you've told us, there's great opportunity for us to come together, local residents, lectures, talks, you know, things such as author readings and poetry slams um, can happen in the community space. Student musicians, travel, everything that you can think of where we wanna to come together and just share with each other. We have in the building um, designed a large area for community gatherings. And we are able, we have just now, we're in the process of installing a divider in that large area. So two groups could be meeting simultaneously. And I, I can't stress enough how, how incredibly busy I expect this place to be. We've already had a community meeting. We had our first uh, community gathering in the library under construction uh, just earlier this week. So, or last week. Um, we're very excited about that space, and, and I want to mention again that it's free to use. It's, it's one of the reasons we built this library, is to create a place that was free for everyone to use to gather together. So when then we have Metal, Metal Nature Notes, which is a, a, an organization with over a thousand members talking about the unique, you know, the natural landscape that we live in and sharing, sharing with each other on those stories. Um, lots of book groups, club meetings can meet in the library. And of course, we all know our nonprofit community, uh, our, our valley depends on our nonprofit community, and we expect them to gather in the library as well. We've been working very closely with the school district on how our library can support K through 12. Uh, student enrichment. And so we, we will work with the, the school district on, on hosting homework clubs, after school usage, and additional space for at-home learners and um, after school programming, and, and really just a safe place for teens and tweens to hang out um, with resources available to them, both in both technology resources as well as human resources available to our youth. So uh, we're very excited about this space that our community will use. Todd, I am going, I'll, I'll introduce Todd Treat. He's here with us. Todd is the director of, uh, or the vice president of instruction for Wenatchee Valley College. And we started talking to them probably about a year ago about how yeah. Wenatchee Valley College could work together. And that relationship has evolved, and um, we've got some very exciting news to announce. If you have not heard, I'll let Todd explain it. And, and with that, I'll hand it over to Todd Tree. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm really delighted to see how many folks are here. I, uh, I had to kind of scroll to the side here and uh, just want to encourage you at any point, if you have a question, um, you know, jump in. I can, I can uh, sort of ensure that this goes in the direction you want you want it to go, but I, I guess I want to start by uh, thanking Fowl uh, and NCW Libraries for uh, just some really outstanding partnership work that um, began over a cup of coffee in Pateros uh, with one of the Fowl board members, and uh, the conversation was really um, we're going to do something special for Winthrop. And we'd like the college to think about whether it wants to be part of it. And it just so happens, I, I think I was in my second year at the college at that time, that we had been looking for a long time for ways that we could reach um, the Metal Valley with our educational services more effectively. So there was this beautiful opportunity where our mission around North Central Washington dovetailed with the goals of FOWL, uh, the town of Winthrop and, and 
uh, in CW libraries to provide instructional opportunities for Winthrop and the broader Metau Valley right there at the library at the library itself. And, uh, and so you can see just uh, on this mission slide that uh, we serve a, a region that's Chelan, Douglas and Okanagan County, and we provide uh, different kinds of college level education. Uh, we offer a lot of transfer education. These are students, um, sometimes adult learners, but predominantly uh, high school students and high school graduates who intend to go on and get a four-year bachelor's degree. Uh, we also offer a lot of professional technical programs in areas like uh, HVAC, um, refrigeration, if you will, uh, industrial technologies, nursing, uh, medical assisting, uh, business. There's just a whole variety of programs uh, that we offer in professional technical. And we also offer what are, what's called basic skills uh, instruction. Basic skill instruction can either be uh, learning English as an additional language uh, or uh, earning a high school diploma if uh, someone had uh, exited high school before they graduated. And finally, we have a continuing education arm that offers a variety of uh, public interest uh, seminars and short-term courses that range from learning Spanish to uh, basket weaving, only in this case, it's native basket weaving, um, to uh, actually some quite uh, high-tech programs around fire science and other kinds of things. So that continuing education is online credit and is really intended to meet the needs of community members, whether they have a college degree already or not, they just want to continue to take some classes. I mentioned all of that because we try to meet the, those three counties needs on two campuses, one in Wenatchee and one in OMAC. And you know all too well that neither of those is very accessible to Winthrop. So we also offer a lot of online uh, programming, but not everyone likes online programming. Sometimes people want to actually do things with their hands or they want to be able to interact with a speaker uh, and they want to do so face to face. So all of this coalesced to uh, us having an opportunity to partner with Val, and I'll ask for the next slide, please, uh, to provide different kinds of programs. Uh, so the programs that we're predominantly thinking about at this moment are in three areas. These programs will be offered on the north side of the library in a large uh, very large classroom setting that actually has a divider wall. And we will share that space, um, as others will mention, I'm sure later, with a variety of community interests. But what we'll be doing is offering classes for our Running Start dual credit students. These are students uh, who would be um, currently in high school and going to school just a few miles up the road, who might ride their bike, walk, ski, or, or drive down to the library to take a class. Those, cl those classes will be predominantly um, in the morning, we believe, and they'll be predominantly transfer classes, history, political science, mathematics, uh, science. Uh, and those classes might have some face-to-face -face components and online components, or they might be fully face-to-face. -face. Uh, they might be fully remote. Uh, the example I like to use, um, uh, for this particular kind of programming is Professor Peter Donahue, who I'm sure many of you know, who lives in, in Winthrop. Peter has, for many years, driven over the loop loop and teaches in OMAC. But once this opens, he'll be able to offer the class that he teaches in OMAC via Zoom from the library in Winthrop and have face-to-face -face students in front of him at the same time. Uh, I haven't spoken to him personally about it. I bet he's pretty excited about the opportunity. Uh, I know there are others who are excited about opportunities like that too. And it really, I think, is going to open up uh, opportunities for students, uh, pr again, predominantly tr uh, traditional students who are in Running Start classes. Now, what's important about this too is that a Running Start student is in a college class, and that means an adult can come in and take that class too. So if there's a political science class being offered at nine o'clock in the morning by Wenatchee Valley College at the Winthrop Library, anyone can come and take it. And, uh, and so that's exciting. We expect, um, or at least I'm hopeful that we'll have three to four classes uh, a quarter. And if the students really like that, maybe we expand and, and we'll try to really be tailoring that to the needs of students. Before I move on, are there, are there any questions about 
transfer classes and running start? Everyone's welcome to use the chat as well. We'll monitor the chat, but feel, feel free to unmute and ask a question at, at any time. Thank you. So the next group of students who we uh, know there's a need for serving in the Metal Valley are basic skills students. Uh, there are a number of folks who either exited high school early or maybe have uh, moved into the region from other places and just want to improve their reading, writing, listening, speaking skills. Um, they maybe want to earn their high school diploma, which opens a lot of employment opportunities for them. And so we, we need to tailor these classes a little more carefully. We'll have to uh, cultivate relationships with uh, area partners and try to identify where the adult learner needs are. Is it better to offer these classes at night uh, you know, so people can work during the day? Or do people have childcare needs, so they really want to take these classes during the day so that they can um, they can pursue their diploma? But those classes uh, we are committed to offering. Uh, High School Twenty One Plus, in particular, is a program that has received national attention from um, from other states, uh, uh, and and really has produced a lot of high school diplomas on the part of. Um, of colleges and universities in the state of Washington. You might have heard of GED testing. High School 21 Plus actually replaces GED testing so that students who complete High School 21 get a diploma, but they don't take the GED test. And so it's really our preferred way to advance a student from high school into college. And what a lot of class uh, classes do is they'll uh, offer an opportunity for uh, students to begin to get a college transcript while they're doing High School 21 Plus. So, Again, we're going to try to meet the needs of the Metal Valley and the greater Metal Valley through that um, that offering. Next slide, please. Uh, and now I want to go to uh, a couple of very specific areas where we need to partner. We do know that there's uh, a lot of need around medical care. CNA, a certified nurse assistant in particular, is one that we're looking at right now. Uh, how can we provide uh, education for CNAs that can meet the needs uh, in the Metal so that folks don't necessarily have to drive uh, to one of the nearest hospitals, which you know is, is either over uh, in another part of the Okanagan or further south. Um, computer technology that skilled trades is one that we've talked about, uh, particularly using the makerspace in the library, uh, which um, there's an opportunity to do. So we could have some limited uh, uh, short-term certificates that we would offer in skilled trades. Uh, and then continuing adult ed, this is one that I hope uh, a number of you find uh, exciting. So these enrichment classes that you see listed here, languages, genealogy, nature, job, and also job training are really customized to a community interest. If there's something that folks would like to learn more about, Continuing Ed finds the instructor and we just, we totally tailor it around the, the needs and interests of the community. So for folks who um, maybe already have their college diploma or are uh, even retired and they want um, to learn, Continuing Ed's a great option and we'll schedule around that. That's a place where we'll probably end up in the evening, I'm imagining, and uh, we'll be sharing that, that double room space with other uh, community groups as we do that. Finally, uh, you can see Peter is down there and uh, also uh, Jennifer Tate Libby, who uh, teaches uh, at the college and also down at Big Bend Community College. Um, those faculty do live in Winthrop and we have a couple of others who are up in that area who will, um, I'm sure, try to uh, uh, teach from the Winthrop Library campus when they can. So other questions about, about those programs? Okay, I don't, I think that might be my last slide. Can we advance it one more and see if there are other, before we, so if it's possible, before uh, I let go of the reins here, I want to acknowledge that NCW Libraries loves this model. And so we actually are talking about replicating what we're doing it, uh, in Winthrop in some other libraries, particularly where our reach is pretty limited, like, uh, Oroville and Tenasket area, maybe Brewster Pateras area, Bridgeport area. So um, 
you are groundbreaking something that I think is going to end up being a really cool network uh, for North Central Washington. And with that, I thank you. Todd, there's a, a question for you uh, in the chat, and okay. I'm happy to read it, or I can, uh, or you can pull it up. Uh, I right. will read it on behalf of of Craig. He well, says. Uh, I'm excited about the opportunities that partnerships with the college in North Central Washington allow us to generate events like the recent NCW Robin Wall Kimmer or Braiding Sweetgrass talk. It was value to the college, to bookish folks, and to the Metow community interest in climate and culturally diverse forms of knowing a landscape such as the Metow Valley. I'd love to hear from Todd how big a lift an event like this can be and how FAL might partner to uh, offer significant outside author focused events. Can you talk about the benefits and opportunities? Uh, that's actually such a wonderful example. Um, we bring in authors series in a variety of ways. Uh, one, uh, as uh, Craig has mentioned, is in partnership with NC Library, NCW Libraries, um, where they will identify kind of a, a, a book read and collectively groups bring authors in. And those authors, um, often meet a couple different places. They might they might meet down in Wenatchee and then they'll come north and, and meet in a variety of places. The, the sheer beauty and, and uh, logistical capability of the Winthrop Library is one that's I'm sure gonna be extremely attractive for that kind of thing. Another area in which the college offers um, authorship series is that in fact, uh, next week we have an alumnus of, um, WC, WVC OMAC, who's going to be coming in on student government um, sponsored book read. Um, I forgot her first name, but Mrs. Miss Fox is her last name. I can look up that book while we're uh, while we're talking here. But in an instance like that, we could certainly have the author that we have sponsored spend some time in the library, and and I think that that's a, a really excellent uh, way for us to. Uh, partner. Uh, just to kind of follow up, Wendy J. Fox uh, is an alumnus of WBC, and uh, she wrote a book called What If We Were Somewhere Else? And uh, and she lives in, in Denver, Colorado, I believe, and is going to be coming up for a book read next week. So that's just a really great example. We have a lot of active authors at WVC, including Peter Donahue, but also a couple of renowned poets who um, you know we could bring up for a night to do a, a poetry read or a slam and uh, and so I think that kind of thing is is a really great option. Did I answer your question, Craig? Yeah, awesome. absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for me? Okay, thank you. It's a quiet group tonight. Todd, thank you so much for presenting and for helping to make this partnership a reality. It really is an exceptional opportunity. And I will just say on behalf of the board and and uh, also I know Jill has put a ton of time into this. I think one of the things that is most exciting for all of us is that the heart of this project always has been, how can this not just be a singular thing, but how can it benefit people as far as you can imagine? And I think one of the wonderful things that this partnership shows is a, a um, essentially a template that you are now discussing with NCWL for other communities to benefit from as well. So the same way with the state grant for the libraries, that was something that was then made available to libraries across the state. And so these are all examples of ways that this project really benefits people across the state of Washington and certainly throughout uh, the district for NCWL. So thank you so much, Todd, for making this a reality. Thank you. No questions at all. This is a quiet group tonight. Feel like we should throw you out some icebreaker questions, but uh, <laughs> we'll uh, go ahead and go forward. Unfortunately, Ree could not join us tonight, uh, and I know that she is doing an incredible amount of work with NCWL on what programming will look like in the new library. Um, we'll just go through a little bit and uh, see if I can get I'm having a small internet problem here. I think if you have a pixelated, there we go. Um, yeah, so one of the things that is still uh, is still in development between FOWL and NCWL is figuring out how things will be scheduled. But ultimately, NCWL has been just like every partner in this project. And I mean, this has truly been a, a beautiful work of people coming together and finding the best ways possible to work together. And, uh, and NCWL will be managing most of the reservations for rooms, but also bringing in their own 
programs that uh, is something that NCWL has always done. One of the things that we're also so excited about is that in the past, you know, all of your property tax money that supports the library that goes to support the district has not been able to be manifested in the Metau Valley because there hasn't been the space to be able to bring that programming in. So one of the most exciting things that this library allows is bringing that programming that has always been available, that NCWL actually does a beautiful job at presenting with a real emphasis on STEM, but also quite diverse offerings to the people of the Metau Valley and whoever wants to visit because we now will have the space to make that a reality. So uh, RE is working actively again with the NCWL powers that be on that programming and uh, is scheduling that out even for the rest of the year as, as we meet this evening. There is, uh, I, I know there have been some earlier questions about the scheduling of the community rooms and one of the reasons, and as we discussed with uh, with Wenatchee Valley College and working with Todd is ensuring that there was always space available. And so the places that people can meet in the library and we've been having inquiries about this in September. And if you yourself have an inquiry, you should reach out to Re because she's in charge <laughs> of making this all happen. Uh, but um, there will be spaces on both sides of that divider in that community space. And then there is also the maker space, which when it's not being actively used for programming from NCWL or some other sort of a meeting can be used as an additional meeting room. So Craig, go ahead. Yeah, Santa, and I've appreciated Jill mentioning you know, they're building an acoustical divider and a yes. removable wall so that they have two, two rooms available as classrooms, but it also opens up to seat 72 people. And in that, in, in that um, author kind of conversation, um, it's that larger space too that I think people um, should, should look. I, I thought I was talking to Reed today about the makerspace. Um, that, that room is a, a sort of a self-contained room, but it's a wide open uh, room and, and a tremendous amount of resources are available with, from NCW that um, belong to all of us as taxpayers, but they'll be able to uh, bring them up and house them and, and make uh, programs available. And, you know, when you say makerspace, sometimes people need that demystified and it can be simple, as simple as six sewing machines or uh, as dreamy as Re was talking about having a, a 10 foot roll in kitchen and doing uh, cooking classes, that is makerspace, as is the programming they're currently offering. In a week or so, they're doing a Japanese style of bookmaking. And so, um, you know, when they say makerspace, don't just think high tech uh, laser printers and laser cutters that are available and robotics, but um, also think about some of the traditional uh, valley um, I, I know that the quilters have already identified the library as, as a, a, a grand week, uh, an opening week space to uh, showcase some of the traditional uh, maker activities of the Valley. So I'm just tickled as all get out that there's really three um, contained rooms and that the one of them can grow into a larger um, public sharing space for things like large uh, lectures or author events in partnership. Yeah, thank you, Craig. That's great. And also the larger library as well, right? I think all of those spaces are, are potential use areas for, for people. So the only thing you absolutely have to know is the location of the library. Hopefully every single person on the call does know the location of the library. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, if you've gone off camera, that's totally fine. You can write it in the chat or you can come back on camera, but I'd love to hear what resonates for you with this conversation today, what you're looking forward to in the library in particular. Don't make me call you out by name. You know I will. <laughs> Boo. What are you looking forward to? Oh, let's see here. Oh, I'm on. <laughs> um, I'm looking forward to a place to sit down yeah. and enjoy the space. But also I would personally like to probably volunteer, maybe tutor some kids, that kind of thing. That's awesome. That is awesome. I love hearing that idea because the other thing that's been discussed is kids tutoring adults on things like uh, Microsoft Office and social media and other sorts of tech platforms that um, the kids seem to know more about than we do. 
And Boo, you also mentioned in the chat, thank you, that there are a lot of spaces outside, especially as we continue to do this final push for fundraising to bring in that outdoor library as well, that not just inform, but also provide the space to gather uh, in all but uh, our winter season. So although there's probably a few hardcores that would, would gather outside. Marion, do you have any hopes and dreams that uh, are specific enough to share? Well, right now in Bellingham, we're in the midst of the Whatcom Reads Week, which is an annual event where one book is selected and everybody reads it. And we have author events and we have, uh, oh, just a whole range of things. Uh, the state poet laureate came um this this year's book is greenwood which resonates with with all of us i think because of climate change um so i'm thinking you know we can have meta reads and author events a whole series of events centered on the library uh exploring a particular book or a particular aspect i think that would be great fantastic and for anyone who doesn't know, Marion uh, is a person of many talents, a library supporter and one of our local authors as well. So oh, make sure you look up her plug. books. <laughs> Deneen, do you have anything uh, that you're looking forward to in particular? I'm laughing, I'm, I'm trying to write <laughs> oh. <laughs> on my iPad, it's going very slow. Anyway, what I'm really looking forward to is really the outdoor space, um, being able to go over in the morning and, and drink my coffee and, and go in and explore the library. I mean, I'm there a lot anyway. Um, but the things I'm really excited about are all the things that, like you said, we haven't had before in the library and programs that we can expand upon, like, like for me, renting snowshoes or adult education or other fun, you know, classes, you know, that we haven't had before here. So those are the most exciting new things for me. Uh, that's fantastic. That's a, that's a wonderful new perspective. Thank you. Jim, yeah, what about you? you? It'll be much easier to call on you when we're all in, in person again. You talking to me? I'm talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> you do call people out. I do. I do. I'm terrible. I have two kids. I'm, I know all about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just glad to see what's going on. I don't have any needs or wants. All right. Well, Jim's been a big help in uh, an advisory role for us as well. So uh, there are, and actually, Jim, I'm, I'm going to, um, highlight you in, in saying that you are an example of, I think, a number of people who have really, you know, not on the board, not on the, for no formal reason, but have offered very significant advisory help uh, on a project that requires that in a way that we wouldn't all have been able to, uh, we would never have been able to expect or anticipate or plan for. So thank you very, very much for being one of those people and making this possible and, and making it uh, the success that it really is. Well, you're welcome. Uh, we just moved into the valley a year ago, and now that's our new home. Well, well, we'll be seeing you at the library for sure. Yes, you bet. <laughs> Jim and, and Shannon, it reminds me, um, I, for people who don't know me, I'm a retired school librarian. And um, one, of the, one of the things that brings me to Fowl is a notion that the community is the collection. And so things like the community college is part of the library and uh, tapping into people like Jim's um, ability that, um, and the books that are created by people like Marion and, and all the other authors in our midst, that the library really is that community. I was reminded when Deneen spoke about sitting with a cup of coffee and then exploring that uh, the physical proximity of the library, both the outdoor learning space and then the indoor heated uh, in the winter while your kids are slamming through hockey, um, that the physical opportunity to have a community space in addition to an icy parking lot is, I think, of major community uh, significance. But I, thank you. Thank you all for, for your points.
Yeah. Well, but, and Craig, I know you show when Craig joined the board when uh, uh, some time ago now, and we're so incredibly fortunate to have him because he comes with a, a whole career full of expertise on exactly these sorts of things. But I do remember Craig shared something with us that was a um, a recording of somebody talking about community as the library or the library as the community as the collection, right? And that has always resonated with this board and, and I think with this community in a very special way. So, Luis, do you have any hopes and dreams? Luis isn't going to bite. <laughs> That's all right. How about Carrie? Uh, Kari. Kari, thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, I am not new to the Valley, but new to living here full time. So I just started living here full time in January and um, have just been really excited to follow the progress of the new library. Um, I live out on Wolf Creek, so I'm not that far. And I think it's just going to be an awesome resource. And I'm just so impressed with, you know, what I've read in the Metow Valley News and seen from your um, foul newsletters and emails about all the things that you're going to be doing there. And um, I'll just be excited to participate as a, you know, as a community member and potentially as some sort of volunteer. I don't know yet, <laughs> but it just looks like it's going to be, you know, beautiful and awesome and fill so many needs in the community. So I think it's wonderful and kudos to you all. Kari, great to have you. And uh, thanks so much for joining us with this. I, I see the Fisher skis and uh, Marion and I and maybe others are on Wolf Creek as well. So we'll look for you as we're uh, heading oh, to the library. Awesome. Yep. I'm always Definitely. looking for, you know, hiking and skiing partners. So <laughs> excellent. Very good. Now, Marcy, you're probably here recording for the newspaper, but do you have hopes and dreams too? Um, yes, I am reporting, so I guess I'm not supposed to have an opinion, but um, <laughs> well, I think it's it'll be really exciting to have more chances for lectures and continuing education. So I'm looking forward to all that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we're talking uh, as the grand opening committee has been working, I will say that um, Rhea is putting lots of things together for the library opening week. And we've talked about uh, Cascadia music and some of the, the kids or adults possibly playing. And there's really uh, endless opportunities for, for uh, showcasing and coming together as community. And I uh, recall again, as we start to close up here, um, first of all, Boo reminds me that the video of community as our collection is on the website and has a link to that in the chat. If you have an interest in checking in on that. But uh, as we first started this project, and this was in, uh, this was a long time ago, it was <laughs> 2017. And uh, one of the piece, one of the books that a number of us read, and I commend to you if you haven't yet, well, first of all, the library book by Susan Orlean, you should pick up if you haven't already. But the second is Palaces for the People. And it's a social scientist, Eric Klinenberg. And he looks at, specifically, he looks at the, um, uh, the heat wave of Chicago in the late 1990s and the mortality and the demographic distribution of that mortality. And as you would expect, those in more affluent areas fared better and those in less affluent areas fared worse. Uh, but those even in the least affluent areas, in the most um, economically challenged areas that had a library fared better than anybody. And part of that is the library is this place that we come together, right? We come together and that increases empathy and that proximity increases empathy, which then increases community resilience as a community. And for a community that faces the challenge that any community might, but especially for us with wildfires and everything comes down the pike, uh, that's a pretty compelling and, and specific um, uh, data point that really resonated, I know, for a lot of us uh, as we have been working on this project, that this is about empathy, it's about community, it's about resilience at, at the uh, at the bottom of it. And we are here to gather and to connect and to discover. So thank you all tonight for gathering. Thank you all for connecting. Thank you all for helping us discover what it is that we are working towards. And uh, we look forward very much to gathering again next week. Uh, you'll be able again to get some insight into the art and the architecture, which is a lot of fun. Yeah, please do join next week for sure. Um, Wednesday at 5 p.m. And uh, and looking forward to seeing you on the trails. Craig has one last comment, it looks like. Well, I, I just wanted to thank Todd uh, again for the work that you've put yes. into making this, this partnership happen, because I think um, you look at where, where the community is and where the community is going, and it's embodied in the work that you do at Wenatchee Valley College. So 
I appreciate your responsiveness to our overtures and I look forward to that continuing because uh, it's, a, it's a tremendous e example of community responsiveness to opportunity. Thank you, Todd. Well, thank you. And it's, uh, of course, gives me an opportunity to get it on Little Wolf uh, and do my own skiing as well. So thank you. <laughs> I, I, we hope you will. We hope you will. And, and, you know, there will be places to put skis outside the library doors for all of us who are so inclined. So that's the plan. <laughs> thank you all again. We'll go ahead and close up tonight, but we will see you, I hope, next Wednesday. And thank you all for your time, for your energy, for your support. It really has been a, a, an honor to work on this because of this community and because of your involvement. So thanks all again. Take care.